went to see the exhibition Open Score, which you're all going to see tonight, and here are many of the artists that participated in that exhibition. When I saw the exhibition, I thought, oh, this would be so wonderful if I could figure out a way to uh, bring it up here to Tampa, Florida. And indeed, uh, Noelle Smith has worked with the curators, Luis Gomez and Denise Montes, to uh, select certain works from this very large exhibition that was in Havana and bring them here to the campus. And we are very lucky because many of the artists, almost all of them that are in the exhibition, are here and have helped install their work. And when you go over to visit the exhibition, you'll understand why that was so important. Um, Luis Gomez is an artist that I met on my very first trip to Cuba. And that was in, when was that, Noel? In 2000? November 2000. And that was for the seventh uh, uh, Havana Biennial. And I've followed Luis's work uh, all these years, each time going down to Havana, uh, really meeting with him and enjoying not only the development of his work, but the tra tra trajectory or the arena in which he works, which is a little outside of many of the generation of artists that have become so well known uh, and been exported from uh, Cuba internationally. Um, he, all, um, he works with electronic uh, media, which seemed to me to be a very difficult thing to do in Havana, Cuba. And indeed, I was really amazed, as was Noel, that this exhibition that was so technology-based could, could really survive in, um, the, or develop, be developed and, and continue to operate during the course of the exhibition, and it did pretty well. Uh, and talking with the artists, they said they pr practically brought everything they could think of that they might mean, need down to Havana in order to install their work. Um, Noelle Smith is the curator of Latin American art, and she also wears the hat of the director of the Museum Studies Program, and she also wears the hat of curator of education. So I think you're kind of in your full role tonight with every hat uh, assembled tonight, Noelle. It seemed to me it was also really important for a couple of other reasons to bring this exhibition to Tampa. One, the title, Open Score, uh, refers to a series of collaborations between Bell Laboratories and 11 artists in about 1966. And Open Score was a project of performance between Frank Stella and, um, and that uh, Rauschenberg organized. And that seemed important. And the other was that the University of South Florida, uh, under the uh, founding director of graphic studio, Donald Saff, developed uh, with Rauschenberg the Rauschenberg uh, Overseas International, uh, no, Cultural Interchange, International Cultural Interchange. And the exhibition of Rauschenberg's work went to Havana. And actually, many of the artists that are working today uh, uh, in Cuba uh, remember that exhibition, and it's, it had a real impact and influence on their work. So it's really a constellation of reasons that seems to make sense for this exhibition to be here. So I'm delighted you're all here. I uh, hope you'll join the conversation, and I'm now going to turn this over to Noelle Smith. Thank you, Margaret. It's great to see you all tonight. Thank you for coming. Um, this has been a wonderful experience working on this exhibition, and um, I want to thank everybody involved, from Havana to Tampa to Montreal <laughs> to Bogota um, to Buenos Aires. Um, this is a truly multicultural and multidisciplinary um, exhibition, um, and an exhibition of this complicated, and as Margaret said, you'll see just how incredibly complicated each of the pieces is, uh, doesn't really happen uh, without some really serious muscle behind it. And that muscle has been Margaret Miller, <laughs> who has um, really, for her vision and unwavering support, and also I want to thank Deputy Director Alexa Favata and the incredible faculty and staff of the Contemporary Art Museum and the Institute for Research and Art. We started working on this exhibition in June. Normally an exhibition of this magnitude is going to take at least a year. So from the very beginning, 
they've really expressed incredible support and incredible enthusiasm for the project. And we couldn't have got it done without them and without the artists. Um, as soon as Luis and Donnie gave us permission to start working on the exhibition, I contacted the artists. You know, we had to, we had to make a kind of um, of addition of the show that was in Havana because it was in this enormous palace um, on the Malecon in, in Havana, and um, it just all wouldn't fit. So we had to make a kind of addition of it. And as soon as I contacted the artists, they all said they wanted to come to Tampa, so, and they have, and they've spent the week here, they've been working every day. We did manage to feed them quite well, take them to see the Dali. <laughs> so we did entertain them, but they've been working very, very hard to bring this exhibition to you. So really, I thank you from the bottom of my heart for being here, and I'm awed to be here with you because they are such incredibly accomplished wonderful artists. Um, and their practices, as you will see, lie at the core of international contemporary art discourse. And I'm just going to talk of, about a few of the issues that this exhibition deals with. Um, deals with issues of collective authorship and civic participation, the manner in which computerized technology and software influence group imagery and model our perception of reality, the possibilities that technologies offer as tools for poetic expression in, in art and daily life. And it also responds to the pressing need for visual literacy in our culture, as saturated as we are with information and, and, um, and uh, imagery. So, what I'm going to do here, as you can see, we have eight artists here. And, um, it was hard to decide exactly how to do this presentation. And finally, we agreed I would briefly present their work. They each gave me a couple of slides, so I'm going to briefly tell you a little bit about them. And when we've done that, then we'll have a discussion. Um, so um, let's get started. I first wanted to introduce you to the curators in Havana. So these were the original curators of the, of the exhibition in Havana. That's Luis Gomez and Danny's Montes de Oca. And you can see with Danny's, there's the, the famous um, lighthouse in Havana that you can see um, behind her. And actually, uh, we wanted them both to be here. And they were actually both here in the fall. But the visa requirements and restrictions uh, prohibited their coming back for the exhibition. And in any case, they did help us with, in the beginning, with a lot of the details. And so I do have a message from Danny's for all of you, for us. And she says, Dear friends, today is our day. I send you a big, big hug. I hope and I desire that an exhibition will be totally successful, and I'm sure it will be. I am grateful and send my congratulations to the artists, and all the team from the U.S. Contemporary Art Studio, uh, Contemporary Art Museum. And I'm with you in spirit, Danny's. So we really wish she could be here. Um, so I'm gonna start with Ingrid Bachman. I'm gonna do this alphabetically. Um, so Ingrid is Associate Professor of Studio Arts and Researcher, uh, well, Associate Professor of Studio Arts at Concordia University in um, Montreal, and she's a researcher at Hexagram, which is a research institute at Concordia, and she's also founder and director of the Institute of Everyday Life. So here is one of her works, it's called Symphony for 54 Shoes, and each shoe has a toe and heel tap, and they um, will do tap dancing. They move or dance independently of each other. And um, Ingrid says of her works, of um, the, her projects continue her exploration of non, oh, here, this is the work, her knit one, swim two. <laughs> this project continues my exploration of non-screen-based computer technology to create works that interact with, confront, and or incorporate the physical world. 
I try to bring the complexity of the real world and experience into the digital experience to complicate the relations between the virtual and the material realms to create works that situate themselves in the world in rich sensory, tactile, and sonic ways. So this interactive installation explores the notion of interface. The movement of the knitting needles is related to an interface board that translates the mechanical motion into a digital signal. Patricia Clark is um, sitting right here, the blondie, <laughs> uh, associate professor at ASU uh, in the New College Division of Humanities, Arts, and Cultural Studies. And I want to say that um, Patricia was very instrumental in the um, genesis of Open Score in Havana. Um, and she's been working very closely with many Cuban artists for about the past 14 years. Um, so working individually in collaboration with other artists and scholars, she explores content areas that lie within the cultural, social, and economic identities of the United States, Latin America, and the Caribbean. She presents multiple windows through which evolving global, national, ethnic, and cultural identity are presented in nonlinear portraits of people, place, and time. And you'll see, um, oh, this last one was uh, Every Day in My Dreams, a single channel video. Excuse me, okay, I'm a little. And this is uh, Los Trabajadores, the Workers, a three channel video installation. And both of these were filmed in Havana. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, actually, they will be in 2014. Oh, okay. and the, the whole um, I wanted to talk a little bit about Luis Gomez, um, um, installation video and media artist. He's a professor at the Instituto Superior de Arte in Havana. Um, for Luis, uh, art is a process that occurs during the encounter between the viewer's experience and the artwork, presenting a multitude of possible interpretations. Uh, hence the creation of environments through installations and space is a constant in his work. This work. So this work, never mind, uh, is a sketch for an installation of the same name, and the drawing illustrates his creative process, the way he starts integrating his installation using two and three dimensional elements. Um, and this one, sound, was a very, very important part of this um, installation. Um, from the series Jules Verne's Room, In and Out, um, he depicts the enclosed space of a mental studio where Verne, as a visionary, highlights inter eternal combinations and possibilities. And from this space, Luis examines the metaphor of the island, the physical and mental limits, and offers the possibility of a journey through the imagination. Antonio Gomez Barrios, sitting over there, um, has traveled um, to be here with us from Cuba. He actually is the only artist from Cuba who was able to be here today. So, thank you, Tuppy. Thank you. So, he's a new media artist and he's a professor at Havana Superior Institute of Art. And I'm quoting from his um, website here. I'm interested in working with those things that have no rational explanation. What escapes our logical thought system, phenomena, which science and philosophy can't yet explain. Many times I use science and philosophy's own tools to question the legacy of rationality and reasoning that we have inherited. So this installation here called Inside, and this is from 2011. So with these telescopes, instead of looking out to the stars, you're looking into microscopic um, images of uh, the human body. This one here, Reclamo, also is from 2010. It's a series of photographs that explore the difference between real and perceived meaning. Martinez Zea, that's Camilo Martinez, and Gabriel Zea. Um, Camilo traveled from Buenos Aires to be with us. Um, and uh, Gabriel traveled from Bogota. They've been working together since 2006. And this actually, you'll see, 
that the exhibition, their work that we have at the Contemporary Museum is actually their master's thesis. So um, very pleased to be um, in, that, in that phase of your life, in that phase of your um, education. So um, they work with open source technologies in collaboration with various groups. They appropriate appropriation processes and conduct experimentation with technology involving their own software and hardware tools. So this is SPAM, and all of their works are very complicated, so I'm going to say very briefly <laughs> what this is. Um, but basically, this turns the public, um, the landline telephone system into a SPAM system. And so, you would make, it's an idea about utilizing a now almost obsolete type of public communication. So in this case, um, you would make a phone call and it would enter into a voice box and then it would ring random numbers. And if you pick up your phone, you would get a message from someone you don't know. Is that right? Okay. <laughs> This one is called Portraiture, and again, custom software. So it's this one, you, um, your software that reads your face and um, makes a, um, um, a text, right? Description, <coughs> text description of your face. And then that is transformed into a, um, QRC, um, QR, code. QR code, and then that is made into a wood block print. So you can see the. <laughs> Wait, you see the one at the museum. Okay, Barry Moon, Barry, uh, is assistant professor in the interdisciplinary arts and performance program at Arizona State University. And he combines various forms of art and technology to create works that encourage interaction between humans and computers. Um, he's created numerous performance works and installations incorporating video processing. He's actually a musician. Um, but this I thought was fascinating. He's also started making computer games. So he evolved one called Ear Trading, E-A-R Trading, um, that he developed in collaboration with his sister Brenda which is a game using music to guide the player through the decision-making process as they trade imaginary stocks on the stock market. <laughs> so, actually I got these mixed up. This actually is Nest. It's Nest, N-E-S-T is in birds. And um, this is also a game. So there's two video screens on either side. And then you can plug these, um, these wires into different jacks, and um, it's a game about body parts and their functions. So it's about toes and fingers and genitals and other things. And this is Swing, um, and this was a public art piece uh, that um, that was installed in Scottsdale, right outside, and um, the uh, viewers can move the pendulums in the bottom, which move the pendulums at the top, and creates music. Although you told me that the uh, people that have the businesses around there didn't consider it to be music. <laughs> okay, Levi Orta is not with us, but we do have an exhibit, uh, work of his in the exhibition, so I wanted to introduce you to him. Uh, he's a Cuban artist based in Havana, although he works extensively um, around the world with videos and performances. And he's interested in the subjective spaces resulting from the implement implementation of power and control in various socio-political contexts. His work intends to escape this control and create its own ideology through the analysis generated by the reproduction of the control mechanism as well as his interpretation. Now some of you may recognize who this gentleman is. This is this portrait here. This is Meyer, um, this is Meyer Lansky. 
who was one of the American mafiosos very, very involved in Cuba. Um, and the mafia in Cuba had plans for Cuba. They were going to tear down a large part of the city and build a string of hotels and casinos. And so what, what Levy has done with this uh, video is to compare Lansky's plans to what actually happened in the 90s in Cuba, which is amazingly like what Lansky um, planned. So he goes to that space kind of where he's, um, where he's, um, co he's comparing what and sort of calling up the hypocrisy or the irony of the government. Um, and this one, um, the Cuban government distributes for their marches and their demonstrations. They distribute um, hats and, and um, t-shirts and things like that. So he has invited people, he invited people to bring those to him and then they would collaborate on altering them and making them into a different kind of fashion. So he's, he's proposing with this a kind of different political climate and different actions, as well as a more individual um, climate. Um, then we have Mariano Sardon right here. Uh, Mariano is professor and chair of the Electronics Art Program at the Universidad de in Buenos Aires, Argentina. And he originally trained as a physicist. He works in installation, painting, and new media. So this work is called, uh, well, 7,000 Miles of Peristalsis. Uh, <laughs> but um, it's within a larger project called Telephony, Telephonies, right? Uh, a project of artistic and technological research, which explores the relationship between data flows of the Hunkal, Tele telecom office and the habitability of the architectonic space of the Telefonica <laughs> Foundation space. So it aims to recuperate the direct perception of telecommunication processes and materialize their abstractions, rhythms, and secret webs by means of different aesthetic strategies. And this was a three year long project in collaboration with the Center of Telecommunication Network team of Telefonica in Argentina. This is uh, Barriaro, has also been working with neurologists. And so um, this is part of a project called Morphologies of Sight. In fact, Mariano was taking our pictures today to use in this project. So the idea is of, um, of attaching um, equipment, a sensor, to um, the viewers um, that would capture the viewer's emotions as the viewer looks at a picture. And so this is 150 different people and their eye motions as they were, they were um, regarding this, this image. Finally, we have Bill Horn. Um, Bill Horn teaches electronic arts in the Department of Studio Arts at Concordia University um, in the Intermedia Cyber Arts Program where he's a full professor. He's responsible of the A-Lab, a robotic art research creation lab, which is part of the Hexagram Institute. So this is actually, we have two of these robots at the Contemporary Art Museum, and um, they move. They have sensors, um, and they have lights, and um, they're pyroelectric sensors that allow the robots to detect the presence of viewers in the nearby environment. Um, so you might be a little surprised to approach them carefully. Um, they react to the viewers according to the amount of stimuli that they receive. Um, and the perceived emergent behavior of these machines engender a multiplicity of interpretations. And this is Gray State Machines, a robotic art performance. Um, and I am gonna quote from the website on this one. Through this project, we want to explore the close relationship between the real physical human body and the machine body. We want to express the inner perceptions of both entities and how they intertwine, blend, mingle, and become blurred as they interact and exchange in an intimate dialogue between the organic and the artifact. The show is a 27-minute stage performance involving solely a human performer 
and a machine. And both are linked via a high-end motion capture system and a set of biofeedback sensors and interfaces. So this has been a very brief look at the incredible work these distinguished artists have done. So I apologize for being so brief, but we don't have much time. And I encourage you to read the bios. Um, I do believe we've included websites. All of the artists have um, extensive, very good websites. And you can learn more about them and, of course, come to the reception and you can speak to the artists about their works. Okay. Okay, so we thought that we would... Are these on? Hello? Yes, they're on. So we thought that we would... Um, have a brief conversation here so you can actually hear from the artists themselves and not just from me. Um, and so we spoke about, um, in the course of this week, during some of our many dinners, we did come up with some, um, maybe some questions um, that we thought um, might be interesting, that I thought might be interesting. And so I'm just going to get things started, but I hope that you guys will carry the ball. and. Um, so, <laughs> Bill. <laughs> so, Let's go. The first question is for Bill. I thought we would flow from those wonderful, wonderful images of those robots to ask this question. Um, so I think underlying this exhibition is the relationship of humans to machines and the many forms that those relationships can take. Um, and I think one of those is our tendency to anthropomorphize these tools, which the technology is really tools. So I can't, couldn't help thinking about some of these pop uh, culture references, uh, uh, Hal in 2001, and the replicants that um, are in that wonderful movie, Blade Runner, the <laughs> robots, but they're so human, they're almost human. Um, and maybe even the relationship that people have with Siri, you know, with the, you know, with the iPhones. Um, but, um, but you don't name your robots. <laughs> so I asked him, Bill, what are your robots' names? Well, he doesn't name his robots. And they're not pets and they're not children, right? Um, so, but on the other hand, it seems like um, the aim of your hysterical machines project is to induce empathy of the viewer towards characters which are really nothing more than articulated metal sculptures. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, it's mostly because for me the most important thing is the effect uh, of the artwork on the viewer. It's not really about uh, you know, the comment I make on technology, it's really about having the viewer doing this projection on, on the objects. Uh, so so the, the, the relationship itself, uh, I, I don't live it with, with, with the objects, with the, with the robots. Or it's more, uh, for me, I'm more interested in what the people who are going to see these works, these machines, uh, what they're going to think about it. So I'm really working in a way that uh, you know, they can interpret as many things as possible and uh, especially that I make them as machine-like as possible. Like I don't put any uh, fur or skin or anything around them. Like it's very raw uh, machines, they're raw robots uh, made of metal and tubes and electrical cables. So it's really about uh, the way that these machines will behave and react to uh, the presence of the viewers, uh, what they are going to interpret from that, because people will see different things. Some will see animals, and some will see uh, human beings, or even people they know sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but I'm really interested in what you know, in this kind of effect that can create uh, onto. Um, 
on them, uh, more than you know, what these machines represent for me. So, because for me, they're just uh, tools, they're just, uh, so that's why I don't have any name or I don't kind of see them as my kids. Uh, they're really uh, objects. Where do you see this project going? Um, that's a good question. Like, <laughs> I'm, I'm making these things in different shapes, in different ways. Like right now, I'm working in a, on a collaborative project, which is a performance project. It's not an installation at all. But this time, the machines are going to be installed on the viewer's body. So they're not going to be installed in the environment, but on the viewers. And they will force the viewers to do certain physical things. <laughs> <laughs> but we're still at the prototype phase, so I won't say much. I can't wait. <laughs> Who do you get to, to Dom? Do you have collaborators who are dancers who are willing to do this? Will you have people, volunteers at the galleries? <laughs> Students. <laughs> <laughs> general question, so I invite anybody who is interested in responding to this. But I think one of the things that Open Score does uh, is to explore the role of technology in shaping our worldview. Um, and in her essay, Danny's Montezeoka, uh, describes the effect as similar to such consensual forms of understanding reality as its ideologies or sciences or politics. Um, so, looking at individual works or looking at your work, how do you feel that Open Score addresses this issue? Okay. Um, um, okay. I, this is horrible. We stayed the first basic part of the question because I started thinking of going down another road. Oh, well, you can go down another road. No, no, no. Give me the first part. Because oh. I have something there. So, one of the things that does, this exhibition does is to explore the role of technology okay. in, in shaping our worldview. Right. And um, what, at least for the overall exhibition, I think the one thing that you will probably walk away with or, or have an experience with overall is the fact that the, the technology is, again, like Bill said, is really not the thing. It's the tool or it's the vehicle. It was the best and most appropriate is to be able to present the idea. The idea is supreme. The concept behind the work is, is the most important thing about really anything we do as artists. And so an open score, um, we play with high tech and with low tech. We play with systems you're familiar with but used in a different way. We play with some systems and things that we use in the way they were intended but didn't put the thing that you would expect to come out of it on them in the case of my own work um, and the piece that I have on the show. So I think really like the paintbrush, like the lump of clay, like the wood or you know the castings that we do in metal, um, technology for a lot of us is simply the means to be able to best present our ideas to you to then experience and interact with. We have that desire to now, we expect, we expect to interact with something. We push a button and we want it to do something, correct? And so that, that desire of, is reflective of our entire culture now. And so it would not be that unusual to have that come through the arts in the way that a lot of us are applying. I mean, I guess I would, I would respond by saying that I don't think um, anybody, including artists, can really speak much about the profundity or the profound effect that technology is having on, on life because you know, we're merely observers, we're not really able to Put it together and figure that out on a very deep level. I mean, there are you know, people like Lev Manovich and people who spend their entire sort of academic 
study looking at, at the, the effect of technology. Um, but even then, I think even most people don't really get to what is happening to the, human, the state of humanity because of technology. Mm -hmm. I, I have a somewhat <clears throat> different view. I guess I think, I mean, I agree with that, but I do think that technology is actually a really shaping force, and it has been designed. And that's why I think it's really important to be aware of who designs it, for what purpose, because I feel I've given a lot of my memory to Google. And I really <laughs> didn't want to do that, but it seems to have happened. So I consciously have to kind of, I've also given away some of my abilities to spell. Yes. <laughs> to spell check. Well, and so I feel that I'm adapting to the technologies, which isn't inherently bad or good. It's simply that I prefer to be sort of aware of it. So I think when artists work with technology, it's also in that realm that they can kind of make some of those uh, observations, maybe amplify them. So in some ways, I suppose, with that one piece, Knit One, Swim Two, that piece was really about the interface. And I want the interface to be heavy, cumbersome, kind of elegant, a bit defiant looking. And so the sense about, that, you know, why should we sit like this? This is uncomfortable uh, at a computer all the time. So it's about opening up some of those things and also maybe suggesting that we all take more agency, take more power in terms of shaping the technology and tools that are around us. Well, I think certainly um, Gabrielle and Camilo have done a lot to take technology, to shape it into their own, to their own ends. Well, actually, I think it's a kind of a bi-directional process in which we try to shift it shape technology and adapt it to our desires, our intentions, but in the process we are being shaped by technology. Right. And what we uh, want to say or transmit at the beginning of the process of, a, of an artwork uh, uh, changes through that process. And we also think that um, the the tools are not like an like a neutral objects you know, which we can which we can control, but also uh, they have like the ethos and the philosophy of a certain um, intention is embedded in the technology, is shaped in the technology, and that in that way we are like um, dealing with with objects that uh, has like the, the trace of human um, agency there. So it's not it's not for us so easy to separate like the, the, this notion of tool and, and intention, but we also think that it's something that is always transforming one thing. I mean, the things I see in your work, which I don't know, I'll just impose, um, you know, is, is the importance of being able to write, create the software, and create this all, and that's probably true of a lot of us, to create this stuff from pretty much the bottom up and not so that you are in control. So, I mean, so it, it is, you know, it is your work, not idea, not, you know, not Apple. Yeah, we develop our all of our software, um, almost part of the hardware too, um, and we get involved with that process because we need to to create our own tools. We are not comfortable in what time when using some program with some software that allows you to do certain things, but not the thing you want to do. So we try to learn how to do that and that's why we get uh, into, into the code. And it's a very, very important part of, 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 our, of our process, uh, as, as can you say. I think with, with all of the tools and with the way with open source code, doing your own programming, um, there, there tends to also to be like an art in the work of control that we did with Luis Gomez. Um, there's sort of a mix of 
software that is there, things we had to write on our own to be able to make the piece work, um, other software, you know, free, downloadable that we could bend to our own will for the idea of the work. So it is a matter, it's kind of a mix of all those things. Again, sort of getting back to that. And you're right, the idea does continually, as you all know, change as you go through the process. And that occurred with that work as well, still trying to get to the meaning of the work and then trying these various avenues until you reach just the right one, the right combination of tools, you know, whether we had to make them ourselves or borrow, you know, consume them. But it is, I mean, it is a lot different from previous technologies in that respect, is that none of us, well, not many of us anyway, were able to build cars. I mean, I don't know that many people who design and build cars, but we can pretty much build our own software. And you can build robots. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you can do the cars. <laughs> <laughs> you can build the robots. <laughs> I, I think artists have always been using whatever is around them right. to uh, express themselves. So technology is just like one more thing, kind of like much of others. I think what's important is, is what you do with it, like what the effort of uh, inverting, converting, uh, perverting, subverting, <laughs> like uh, meaning and form and whatever like principles or ideas are. There's something interesting about artists building tools, and so that the artist also built the tool and not the artwork. And so maybe, it, I think in some ways with some work that deals with technology or new media, there is kind of this opportunity to make work that is more generative and interact, truly interactive, because you can make a tool, the artwork becomes a tool for an experience to happen. And if participants don't interact with it, then nothing happens. Or it can become a generative thing. And I think that idea of, and then what's, you know, the tool away can become, the art object can become an artifact that in some ways the memory of an experience. And I think that kind of shifting of almost tenses is, is really interesting in terms of what maybe, I think, uh, art and technology can kind of offer. It's a kind of rethinking of some of those, um, mm -hmm. those terms. Mm -hmm. Well, I think one thing that's interesting here is that all of these artists have come to work with science, all of you have basically come to work with science from an art point of view. But Mariano mm -hmm. started as a physicist, you trained as a physicist. I used to be a physicist. physicist. So um, can you talk a little um, bit about your journey actually, from, from I science you all, to art? So <laughs> <laughs> that, yeah, um, that's a really complex idea. I particularly think that when you build or build, build a, a tool, actually you put together not only materials or resources, um, you put ideas and sensibilities in there, but you have a, like a human in relationship with the world. Um, it's difficult to affirm that we create a tool. We combine different concepts and products. <coughs> Even if you program in an open source or whatever, you use certain logic uh, rules, certain devices, predefined. Because of why you use those logics, the logical sentences, or why you write in that way the process you want to involve to create something in the world. Um, when you work in science, sometimes you spend a lot of time trying to understand different theories, the way your paradigms, and you, when you set an experimental or some experiment, uh, you put the, those paradigms in, in a sand, in on stage. But sometimes you suddenly uh, aware that you are combining predefined ideas that are very rude in the in, in us like a human being somewhere, or even in a culture and defined culture. You have different ways to think about this. Um, you, 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 
you can think in a different paradigms. Many different ideas about technology and science itself, for instance, they have a political and uh, even cultural dimension of it. It's very different to think of the science and technology in Argentina than in, um, in, in the States. It's very different. It involves different perceptions of the world, different rules, and even the logical ways to do is very different. So, uh, one of the things that I think is very um, dangerous in some sense is just to think that technology like a category that involves all the process in which you are uh, in relation constantly. I think this. Um, I would like prefer the way that each human being do in the world with the things. And even if you use the painting, even if you use a uh, software or a robot or whatever process, it's interesting to have an idea of what are you doing with that, uh, that perception, construction, or even with your culture at the end. So, that's, <laughs> I think it works actually. So, all of you were in Havana. Very you were, nice. except for you. You were. So US government. They didn't let you in. Or was it the Cubans who didn't let you in? The US wouldn't let them out. Nobody wanted you. Yeah, the US wouldn't let you in. Shucks. So, um, how, besides the fact that the exhibition is for smaller, but just as you said, there's, but you just said that things are much different from one culture to another. And right. So how do you feel, um, Tony? Do you want to talk a little bit about? Just that I do prefer to speak in Spanish. <laughs> okay. Well, you've been kind of quiet down here. So. No, I completely agree with uh, Mariano. Uh, for us, the, the technology. It's a political position um, because uh, we live in a, in a completely different country, and uh, for us the technology is a, is a just a tool. For example, I come from the uh, painting, no, yeah. painting a new yeah. um, uh, world, and uh, I just uh, stopped to paint because the the art for me is a, a Una constante fermentación, es el experimentación. And uh, the technology is a is a very good tool to express what I think about art and about uh, the world in general. Uh, I think that the the uh, language. It's a reflection of our thoughts, and um, it's uh, the first uh, technology tools what we made, what we controlled. And all the time, I I try to question this, you know, this kind of uh, how can I say? Say it. In Spanish. Yeah, in Spanish. <laughs> Eh, trabajo con el lenguaje y trabajo eh, con la tecnología porque como decía anteriormente eh, el lenguaje fue la digamos el, el resultado de es el resultado de una alta tecnología pero eh, por otra parte es el digamos es, es una caricatura del pensamiento no y de alguna forma la tecnología es caricatura no el, el, el lenguaje oh. Language is like a caricature of yeah. thinking, of yeah. thought. Yes. Right. Yeah. Entonces, eh... <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to me. This is difficult. Yeah. Do you, um, do, do Cuban artists um, encounter significant di difficulties in working with this type of technology in Cuba? Yes. <laughs> Oh yes. So so Tony's piece um, 
which is a beautiful piece um, in Havana, was um, suffered from the consequences of not being able to find anything in Cuba, right? So it has a vibratory, pro uh, vibratory aspect to it. Um, so that when you walk, you'll see it, but when you walk by these, these uh, word images, um, there's uh, a kind of vibration that interrupts your being able to, to look and read these. So in Cuba, Tony used sanders. Yes. The kind of sanders you sand your floor with. Mm -hmm. um, because that's what he could find that would give that vibration. But what happened is it made the piece so loud that they had to turn it off all the time. <laughs> he was so brave. He was so brave. <laughs> well, we all love so we had a performance art piece that was happening simultaneously, so there was a little negotiation. <laughs> so when we invited Tony, because that was a piece that we particularly loved from the, from the show, but when we invited Tony um, to show here in Tampa, he really didn't want to because he felt like his piece wasn't very well constructed by Tony. So we offered to remake the piece for him. And so Tyler, uh, Taylor Pillow, who was our um, who was our um, sculpture fabricator for Graphic Studio, um, had a lot of conversation, email correspondence with Tony, and we reconst he reconstructed the piece. So it's, it's kind of a symptom of what happened with moving the piece, for, moving the show from Havana to Tampa, and it lost some things and it gained some things. <laughs> and it, uh, Camilo and, and Gabrielle's piece also suffered um, a similar purification. <laughs> that, that one piece that they have that, that is meant to be kind of a ballast. And here, it's another piece that we partially reconstructed here and was very well constructed by Keenan Almeida, who's one of the preparators at USA. Um, uh, in Cuba, it was, a, it was a cardboard box full of paper. Um, so there was a loss and a gain there, I think. There was some aesthetic um, sacrifices and some aesthetic gains. Um, and I think what the underlines money on this comment about that cultural approach and difference to, to technology and being, and the, the amazing inventiveness and the application of what is possible in Havana or in other places, and, you know, Bogotá, but, you know, when you can't, can or cannot put your hands on the thing you want right away, then you get very creative, very creative. Right. But it, it's also for the viewers, because in, in Havana, like, it was one of the first times where they right. were able to see this kind of work. Yes. As, I don't know uh, about Tampa, but if you do the same thing in Montreal, it's going to be pretty different because people are used to see uh, right. like shows with right. technologies and festivals using technologies. Right. And uh, at some point, you know, like it's not about novelty, but it's going to be more about oh, comparing this and that and saying, oh, I've seen this uh, in a better show. Or it's a totally different uh, situation. But I think it still holds up. I think it's still a, a beautiful show. It can't help me with all this wonderful work. So it, I think it's 7 o'clock. It's time to eat, drink, and, <laughs> <laughs> and be merry. <laughs> so Very lucky you have an amazing fine artist here.